Chapter 17 We kept our course southwardly for four days after giving up the search for Glasses Islands without meeting any ice at all. On the 26th at noon, we were in latitude 63 degrees, 23 south, longitude 41 degrees, 25 west. We now saw several large ice islands and a flow of field ice, not, however, of any great extent. The winds generally blew from the southeast or the northeast, but were very light. Whenever we had a westerly wind, which was seldom, it was invariably attended with a rain squall. Every day we had more or less snow. The thermometer on the 27th stood at 35. January 1st 1828. This day we found ourselves completely hemmed in by the ice, and our prospects looked cheerless indeed. A strong gale blew during the whole forenoon from the northeast and drove large cakes of the drift against the rudder, and counter with such violence that we all trembled for the consequences. Toward evening the gale still blowing with fury, a large field in front separated, and we were enabled by carrying a press of sail to force a passage through the smaller flakes into some open water beyond. As we approached this space we took in sail by degrees, and having at length got clear, lay to under a single reefed foresail. January 2nd We had now tolerably pleasant weather. At noon we found ourselves in latitude 69 degrees, 10 south, longitude 42 degrees, 20 west, having crossed the Antarctic Circle. Very little ice was to be seen to the southward, although large fields of it lay behind us. This day we rigged some sounding gear, using a large iron pot capable of holding twenty gallons, and a line of two hundred fathoms. We found the current setting to the north about a quarter of a mile per hour. The temperature of the air was now about thirty-three. Here we found the variation to be 14 degrees, 28 degrees easterly, per azimuth. January 5th. We had still held on to the southward without any great impediments. On this morning, however, being in latitude 73 degrees, 15 east, longitude 42 degrees, 10 west, we were again brought to a stand by an immense expanse of firm ice. We saw, nevertheless, much open water to the southward, and felt no doubt of being able to reach it eventually. Standing to the eastward along the edge of the flow, we at length came to a passage of about a mile in width, through which we warped our way by sundown. The sea in which we now were was thickly covered with ice islands, but had no field ice, and we pushed on boldly as before. The cold did not seem to increase, although we had snow very frequently, and now and then hell squalls of great violence. Immense flocks of albatross flew over the schooner this day, going from southeast to northwest. January 7th The sea still remained pretty well open, so that we had no difficulty in holding on our course. To the westward we saw some icebergs of incredible size, and in the afternoon passed very near one whose summit could not have been less than four hundred fathoms from the surface of the ocean. Its girth was probably at the base three-quarters of a league, and several streams of water were running from crevices in its sides. We remained in sight of this island two days, and then only lost it in the fog. January 10th Early this morning we had the misfortune to lose a man overboard. He was an American named Peter Vrendenberg, a native of New York, and was one of the most valuable hands on board the schooner. In going over the bows, his foot slipped, and he fell between two cakes of ice, never rising again. At noon of this day we were in latitude 78 degrees, 30 longitude, 40 degrees, 15 west. The cold was now excessive, and we had hail squalls continually from northward and eastward. In this direction also we saw several more immense icebergs, and the whole horizon to the eastward appeared to be blocked up with field ice, rising in tiers, one mass above the other. Some driftwood floated by during the evening, and a great quantity of birds flew over, among which were nellies, petterels, albatrosses, and a large bird of a brilliant blue plumage. The variation here, per azimuth, 
was less than it had been previously to our passing the Antarctic Circle. January 12th. Our passage to the south again looked doubtful, as nothing was to be seen in the direction of the pole but one apparently limitless flow, backed by absolute mountains of ragged ice, one precipice of which arose frowningly above the other. We stood to the westward until the 14th, in the hope of finding an entrance. January 14th. This morning we reached the western extremity of the field which had impeded us, and weathering it, came to an open sea without a particle of ice. Upon sounding with two hundred fathoms, we here found a current setting southwardly at the rate of half a mile per hour. The temperature of air was forty-seven, that of the water thirty-four. We now sailed to the southward without meeting any interruption of moment until the sixteenth, when at noon we were in latitude eighty-one degrees twenty-one, longitude forty-two degrees west. We here again sounded, and found a current setting still southwardly, and at the rate of three-quarters of a mile per hour. The variation per azimuth had diminished, and the temperature of the air was mild and pleasant, the thermometer being as high as fifty-one. At this period not a particle of ice was to be discovered. All hands on board now felt certain of attaining the pole. January 17th this day was full of incident. Innumerable flights of birds flew over us from the southward, and several were shot from the deck. One of them, a species of pelican, proved to be excellent eating. About midday a small flow of ice was seen from the masthead off the larboard bow, and upon it there appeared to be some large animal. As the weather was good and nearly calm, Captain Guy ordered out two of the boats to see what it was. Dirk Peters and myself accompanied the mate in the larger boat. Upon coming upon the flow, we perceived that it was in the possession of a gigantic creature of the race of the Arctic bear, but far exceeding in size the largest of these animals. Being well armed, we made no scruple of attacking it at once. Several shots were fired in quick succession, the most of which took effect, apparently, in the head and body. Nothing discouraged, however. The monster threw himself from the ice, and swam with open jaws to the boat in which were Peters and myself. Owing to the confusion which ensued among us at this unexpected turn of the adventure, no person was ready immediately with a second shot, and the bear had actually succeeded in getting half his vast bulk across our gunwale, and seizing one of the men by the small of his back, before any efficient means were taken to repel him. In this extremity, nothing but the promptness and agility of Peters saved us from destruction. Leaping upon the back of the huge beast, he plunged with the blade of a knife behind the neck, reaching the spinal marrow at a blow. The brute tumbled into the sea lifeless and without a struggle, rolling over Peters as he fell. The latter soon recovered himself, and a rope being thrown him, he secured the carcass before entering the boat. We then returned in triumph to the schooner, towing our trophy behind us. This bear, upon admeasurement, proved to be full fifteen feet in his greatest length. His wool was perfectly white and very coarse, curling tightly. The eyes were of a blood red, and larger than those of the arctic bear. The snout also more rounded, rather resembling the snout of the bulldog. The meat was tender, but excessively rank and fishy although the men devoured it with avidity and declared it excellent eating. Scarcely had we got our prize alongside when the man at the masthead gave the joyful shout of Land on the starboard bow! All hands were now upon the alert, and a breeze springing up very opportunely from the northward and eastward, we were soon close in with the coast. It proved to be a low, rocky islet of about a league in circumference, and although destitute of vegetation, if we accept a species of prickly pear. In approaching it from the northward, a singular ledge of rock is seen projecting into the sea, bearing a strong resemblance to corded bales of cotton. Around this ledge to the westward is a small bay, at the bottom of which our boats effected a convenient landing. It did not take us long to explore every portion of the island, but with one exception, we found nothing worthy of our observation. 
In the southern extremity we picked up near the shore, half buried in a pile of loose stones, a piece of wood, which seemed to have formed the prow of a canoe. There had been evidently some attempt at carving upon it, and Captain Guy fancied that he made out the figure of a tortoise, but the resemblance did not strike me very forcibly. Besides this prow, if such it were, we found no other token that any living creature had ever been here before. Around the coast we discovered occasional small flows of ice, but these were very few. The exact situation of the islet, to which Captain Guy gave the name of Bennett's Islet, in honor of his partner in the ownership of the schooner, is 82 degrees 50 south latitude, 42 degrees 20 west longitude. We had now advanced to the southward more than 8 degrees farther than any previous navigators. As the sea still lay perfectly open before us, we found, too, that the variation uniformly decreased as we proceeded, and what was still more surprising, that the temperature of the air, and latterly of the water, became milder. The weather might even be called pleasant, and we had a steady but very gentle breeze always from some northern point of the compass. The sky was usually clear, with now and then a slight appearance of thin vapor in the southern horizon. This, however, was invariably of brief duration. Two difficulties alone presented themselves to our view. We were getting short of fuel, and symptoms of scurvy had occurred among several of the crew. These considerations began to impress upon Captain Guy the necessity of returning, and he spoke of it frequently. For my own part, confident as I was of soon arriving at land of some description upon the course we were pursuing, and having every reason to believe, from present appearances, that we should not find it the sterile soil met with the higher arctic latitudes, I warmly pressed upon him the expediency of preserving, at least for a few days longer, in the direction we were now holding. So tempting an opportunity of solving the great problem in regard to an Antarctic continent had never yet been afforded to man, and I confess that I felt myself bursting with indignation at the timid and ill-timed suggestions of our commander. I believe, indeed, that while I could not refrain from saying to him on this head had the effect of inducing him to push on. While therefore I cannot but lament the most unfortunate and bloody events which immediately arose from my advice, I must still be allowed to feel some degree of gratification, and having been instrumental, however remotely, in the opening to the eye of science, one of the most intensely exciting secrets which has ever engrossed its attention.